Greetings, everyone. Um, my name is Pio Mahala. Welcome to our last hour conversation. Um, today, we're having a conversation with someone whose claim to fame is that he's my uncle. Um, he has written a couple of books. He's a, he's a multidisciplinary artist. He's a playwright. He's a, a visual artist. He's a, a composer and he's a multi-award winning uh, novelist. Uh, the name is Zeke Sinda. Uh, Malume, welcome, Gunjan. Hi, I'm Gunjan, i I have difficulty uh, you know, uh, introducing you because I, I wish I could capture you in one way and, and say uh, you are this. So um, in your terms, how do you describe yourself and how do all these uh, uh, disciplines uh, uh, synergize? Well, you know, fortunately, there's never ever any need for me to describe myself. And, and when somebody asked me as you have done now, um, I never know how to answer that question because I would rather you describe me or the critics, the academics, um, and the people who are actually paid to describe me. Um, I'm just an artist. And for me, as I've often said, art is art is art. I wake up one morning, I feel like writing a poem, though I am a lousy poet. <laughs> I write a poem. I feel like writing a novel and the next day that I do so, or to paint a picture or to compose a song. To me, all that is part of storytelling. So I'm never worried on how I will categorize it. As I said, I leave that to you academics to do. I just create the art. That's all I do. Okay, just an artist. Maybe if we get to know you, we'll, we'll understand where you're coming from. <laughs> you are also an academic, by the way. Um, <clears throat> your name in full, Zanem Vula. Um, meaning uh, the ones who, who come with rain or, you know, uh, a, a name is given for, for a reason, uh, usually, uh, it has a meaning. Uh, tell us, you were not born a rainy day and how, how, how were you given the name? Well, yes, my name had nothing to do with my own circumstances of birth as to whether it was raining or not, whether I was brought by the rain or I brought the rain, because Zanem Vula can mean any of the two things, the one who was brought by rain or the one who brings the rain. But for me, it had nothing to do with any rain at all, but everything to do with a character in a novel by A.C. Jordan, titled Ingumbo Yeminyaya. I was named after one of the characters in that novel. I think that was a character my father fell in love with and then named me after that, that character. So the case of writing um, followed you after that? I think the case of writing started following me from that very first day when I was named after a character in a novel. And you, you published your first story at age 14. Yeah, I think it was 13, maybe 14, 13, 14. Mm. I would have to really calculate. Why, I don't know exactly, it's because this story was published and I saw it after maybe two years or so. Because what happened was the story was published uh, it was an Isik Hosa story titled Ikrikha Lase Mvubase. 
So it was published by this magazine that was called Wamba. And before it was released, I had to go to exile to join my father in the suit. So people read it in the Eastern Cape when I was already away and I never saw it until they mailed the magazine to me, maybe two years later. Only then, then did I see uh, my story in print. And for it, I got a check of two rounds, which was a lot of money those days. You see, you, you could buy 10 loaves of bread with, with those two rounds. Mm. Wow, so you were very rich uh, as a youngster. <laughs> um, I became rich because of that story. Yes. Uh, we, we've mentioned you, you, you uh, we've made the difference rather to, to, to your father twice uh, in, in a space of uh, uh, in less than 10 minutes. Tell us about your father, who was he and what, what was his interest in the uh, intellectual tradition? Well, you see, my, my father was a very rounded guy in that um, at first he was a teacher, in other words, when I was born. He was a teacher, but also at that time, he was also the president of the ANC Youth League. Uh, so I was born into the ANC myself, the ANC Youth League being the son of the president. He had just taken over in 1947 from Lembede who had passed away. Lembede was the first president of the ANC Youth League and then the second president was my father. So you can see then from that, he was also a politician. But during that time and many years after that, he was also an artist. In other words, a visual artist. Although for him, that was just a hobby. He became very famous for drawing portraits of people. They would say, yo, UAP, angagukupa unjalo. We meant that, you know, he was you know, capturing your image in portraiture. In other words, he was not a Rasta type. Yes. Um... You see, he had that, at that time, he was also a conductor. Later, he also became an orchestral mm. conductor. So from the time I was born then, there were all those influences. He later became a lawyer. There were, there were all those influences, you know, art, music, literature, because, you know, he would recite, uh, even when I was, I was a, a, a baby, he would be reciting Shakespeare and so on because he was an English literature teacher at that time. That, that's before he became a lawyer. Okay, so um, that's your father, his name A. Pimda, who took uh, over the ANC Youth League leadership from uh, Anton Lembede. Yes. Yeah, and um, he, he is known as the spirit behind the formation of the uh, Pan-Africanist Congress. So yes. he was not necessarily a member himself. Uh, I, I usually, you know, his, his, his history documents are usually um, depict him as having been a member of the PAC. Well, they are not very wrong, except for the fact that he never really became a, a member. He agreed with the, the people who broke away to form the, the PAC. He agreed with them philosophically. And indeed, some of their tenets were based on his own philosophy of African nationalism. So in spirit, he was one with them. He was only against the breaking away because he still believed that the ANC could be changed from inside. 
he still believed that he had enough influence on the other youth leaguers, you know, to change and follow what they believe, what later became the Africanist route. Hmm. But of course, Bo were quite adamant on breaking away. Mm -hmm. So he was with them when they broke away, but he never became a member of the PAC. Mm -hmm. He still recognized, of course, as the founding spirit of the PAC. I always wondered before I knew that history, founding spirit. My father was a spirit, you see. <laughs> Only to learn that, no, no, in fact, they are just capturing the fact that you know, what I've just uh, uh, narrated to you now. Yes. That yes, he agreed with them philosophically and indeed their tenets were based on his African nationalism uh, uh, philosophy, but he didn't want to break away from the ANC. He wanted to change the ANC from inside. Okay, uh, well, back to your work. Um, I know you don't know how many books you've written so far. <laughs> you but, <know>. uh, <laughs> um, well, in terms of novels, I think um, uh, last year you published your, your 12th novel, uh, really? With Forest Hymns. Yes. And um, I'd like to know of all your novels, is there one that you can uh, select to say, this is the pinnacle of my writing career, this is uh, the novel that defines my, my career. Oh, that would be very difficult mm -hmm. because uh, I love all those novels for different reasons, you know. There are things I really like, although of course, I mean, as, as, as should be expected, I do forget you know, some elements of my earlier novels. Sometimes even the story itself, I would have to reread it uh, in order to, to remember them. I do know what they are about. I mean, just roughly, you know, and the characters who feature there and so on, but I forget a lot about them. So the novels I can really talk about are the, are the later ones like the way Ferrer's hymns, as you said, because it's still fresh in my mind. Yes. Yeah, well, I can tell you that a lot of them um, are tend to history for inspiration. Um, so I'd like to know why do you think it's important uh, for, for contemporary writers to tend to memory um, in their narratives? Well, you know, all writing, whether you, you, you think so or not, is memory or draws on memory. Mm. Even if you are writing a story that is happening now, by the time you have finished writing that chapter, it is memory already, you know? Mm. Uh, so even a story that purports to be on current issues and current events as we speak, it is memory. But I know that we are talking of distant memory. I like distant memory precisely because I'm able to explore the present. For me, writing historical novels is a way of discussing the present. I feel that any historical novel that has nothing to do with the present is useless in that respect, only in that respect, because there's no novel which is just generally useless, you know, as long as it tells a good story. If I read it and I'm entertained, which is the primary function of a novel anyway, is to entertain you. All the other things are just decorations and so on. Then, of course, it has served its function. To me, history is very crucial because 
It tells us who we are. That's why I say it's about the present. Because we are who we remember. In other words, our very identity is tied in with what we remember. It's tied into memory. Without memory, you do not have an identity. That's why I'm saying we are who we remember. So it's very important then from time to time to bring in into the present who we were and what made us who we are because who we were has made us who we are and it also maps out or it maps the, the, the road to the future for us because from that then we are able to know where we are going and why we are going there. We're not just moving you know, without knowing where we are going and why we are going there. So that's why then I love historical fiction or fictionalized history. Yes, yes. Yeah, well, um, I also remember that at some point you announced that the Zulus of New York was gonna be your last novel. Ah. <laughs> what Zulu happened after Zulu. that? What happened after that? Because this seems to have come after Zulus of New York. <laughs> Man, I thought so too. People think that, oh, he was just hyping the thing and so on, you know, for publicity and all. No, no, no. I don't have time for games uh, 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 completely. Mm. I was telling you the truth when I said that's going to be my last novel. Why? Because I thought, I believed it was going to be my last novel. I felt I was tired of writing novels and I just wanted to focus on writing fiction for children, nonfiction for children, and then of course writing librettos and plays and things like that. You know, things that did not want me to sit down for too long, uh, 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 you know, a story that has to unfold in, you know, um, in, uh, I mean, at length, you know. But it so happened one day, um, a story came to me because it happens like that quite often. I'm sitting down, minding my own business. Then I hear of the people who are dying in Lesotho from gang wars of musicians. Now I knew these musicians. Some of them are people I had worked with when I was in Lesotho. But I, I didn't know there were gang warfare all of a sudden uh, 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 and people were dying Sometimes you would be wearing your T-shirt or a blanket only to find that is the wrong color for that particular place. And then they kill you thinking that you belong or you are a follower. They call them followers. You are a follower of a rival musician. So I was fascinated by this because to me it wreaked of, you know, that East Coast, West Coast uh, thing in America amongst the rappers and MCs and, 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 and so on, where they were fighting, sometimes killing uh, each other. But in the Soto, it was worse because every Saturday there was a funeral in those villages that are famous uh, as the home of these musicians. Many more people died and indeed many more people continue to die. Now this was a story that demanded to be told. Even though I vowed that that's my last novel, this story, because it, it often happens like that, an idea for a story 
comes to my head and then it tells me how it should be told. It may say, well, I'm the kind of a story who can only be a painting. So paint me. Or uh, because my painting is narrative as well. I'm the kind of a story that can only be a song. Sing me or compose a song about me. This one said to me, I cannot be a play. I cannot be a libretto. I cannot be any of those. I must be a novel. And this is a novel that must be told in a particular manner, using the very lyrics of those musicians as part of the prose, as part of the unfolding narrative. You see, when a story comes like that to you, telling you how it should be told, you have no choice but to tell it. There's no way you can defy that. So I had to write that novel. Genkane. <laughs> Well, I, I hope uh, there'll be another one telling you to write. Um, I hope so. <laughs> you know, uh, the way it ends, first of all, we're gonna talk about this. You bring back uh, Doloki, one of your most recognizable characters. Uh, mm. Doloki, we first met him uh, in Ways of Dying. And again, we saw him uh, in Shion, uh, in the Americas. And now Toloki is in Lesotho. So towards the end of the novel, two things happen uh, that left me with uh, contradicting emotions. On the one hand, um, Toloki's tears are buried with someone. At the same time, there's the hint that Toloki is going to or has been to North London, which opens a possibility of uh, uh, Toloki's escapades in, in, in the UK. Can you give us that, please? <laughs> oh, my goodness. That has happened already. It happened in Sion. In other words, this makes the Toloki story a trilogy in that we have ways of dying, which begins where we meet Toloki for the first time. Then we have Wayfarer's hymns in the middle. And then we have Sion as the third, you know, one in the trilogy. This means that in Wayfarer's song, no, no, what is it called? Wayfarer's, Wayfarer's hymns. hymns. Yeah. yeah, in Wayfarer's hymns, when Toloki says, well, I'm leaving for England. In Sion, that's when we meet him. Because he tells us in Sion, he first went to Durham in England, living amongst the saints there. Mm -hmm. And then we find his way to America, where he a uh, then the story of Sion begins. Yes. So that means then that Wayfarer's hymn is in the middle. Sion takes over from Wayfarer's hymns. Mm. Yeah. No, I, I, I was hopeful there um, that we will oh, revisit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we will revisit hopes, North London. <laughs> your hopes have been dashed because we have done so already in Sion. Yes. Um, well, mm. I, I was hoping to see uh, Doloki here in, in Wafra's hymn uh, mourns in more ways than one. Um, he is in what I call a, sta a, a perpetual state of mourning. Um, mm. Why did you take his lover away from him? I'm sad for him. Well, there was no choice because in Sion, in Sion, we are told that Dologi's lover passed away in the suit. You see that? Because when we meet Dologi in Sion, He's just by himself. There is no Noria there. 
But we are told in Sion that Noria died in Lesotho. Then in Wayfarer's hymn, of course, she had to die because that's the middle book. So now we know how she died yes. in Lesotho. And you also reveal that uh, Atoloki did not um, uh, invent professional mourning. Is yes. this partly the realization of the author as uh, something you might not have known when you're writing Ways of Dying? Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. You see, when I wrote Ways of Dying, I thought, because you see, you, you know that when you read my work, there are many influences of the theater of the absurd, the absurdities. So when I was writing Ways of Dying, I thought I was being absurd to have somebody who mourns the dead. Remember, in our cultures here in South Africa, in all of them, we don't have anything uh, such as the, a professional mourner. Somebody who mourns and is paid to do, to do so. The nearest, if now we are moving northwards, the nearest country where we have a professional mourner closest to us is in some cultures in Zambia, you see? And then you go further on, then you find it in ancient Egypt and, and, and so on. Uh, you find it in contemporary Spain, you find it in India, you find it in Taiwan, where there are actual bands, you know, of musicians and mourners whose job is to mourn at funerals and are paid a lot of money for that. I did not know all that when I was writing Ways of Dying. I thought I had invented professional mourning as part of the absurdity. Because to me, it was an absurd idea at the time. I didn't know that it, actually there's nothing absurd about it. It actually does exist and it has existed in history as well. It was only after the book was published when people from, from Ireland or from India, from Taiwan, read the book and said, oh, so you guys in South Africa also have professional money. So they had to, I tell them, no, we don't. I thought I had invented it. So they said, no, you have not. You know, we have nothing to, be, to boast about and say, we, you didn't invent anything. We in our cultures have professional mourning. That is why now Dorothy leaves then, you know, in, in, in Wayfarer's hymns. Uh, and then we meet him in Sion searching for mourning. He's searching for these cultures that have professional mourning in order to improve his own craft, which he as a character thought he had invented. So he said, now that I've learned that I've not invented anything yet, let me go and learn from others who have been doing it for centuries. Yeah, I'm interested to, to know um, how much research went into, into this novel. Um, but also- um, Which one? A way for us him, sorry. <laughs> oh, I see, okay, yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Also, um, you know, you've been described elsewhere as a, as a feminist writer. And we see women here, you know, taking to the fore and uh, at times playing roles that were traditionally reserved for men. Do you think hmm. um, that is permissible in the, in, in the formal culture, which I'm not uh, familiar with? Like where you, yeah, we yeah. have um, a you know, boy child insisting on having um, a, a, a woman dancer, for instance, and they are supposed to come across as tough guys as a group. Okay. You see, fortunately, in Wayfarer's hymns, there's nothing that I'm, I'm inventing. And I know it right from the beginning that I've not invented anything. The culture that I'm portraying there, it was important for me to portray it 
in its realness. In other words, to portray it as I experienced it. This is really the first novel where I am writing from within, because that is my culture. You see that? Uh, even though you think that I'm, I'm closer, I was only, I was closer, but I was socialized into the Soto culture. You see that? Uh, which means that growing up there, I interacted with the people I'm writing about. I'm writing about a culture that I know so very well that I don't need to invent anything. When I talk of Kuseleto Siema, who was a woman of the guard, I'm talking of a live person who was there or is still there. And whenever I, in my novel, I create or I deal with characters who are real people who, who, who actually live, I never ever make them do things they did not do or could not have done. I never make them say things they did not say or could not have said. Where I had the leeway to go to town and run crazy is with my fictional characters. I create boy Charles, that's my creation. I can make him do whatever I like, as long as it resonates within that culture. Mudiehi, the sister, is fictional. But when I talk of uh, Famule, I'm talking of somebody who was there. I can't lie about him, because those who know, those who know, this was not Famule. Famule never did this. When I talk of Mansa, all those are the great musicians, some dead, some alive. Jose Musutu Chagela only died last year from COVID. And you have seen in the novel, he's one of the main characters. Everything that Jose Musutu Chagela does in my novel is something that he either did or could have done. You know, it's within uh, his character to have done that, even if I don't know if he did it or not, you see? So that's how then I created this, uh, this fiction. It's highly informed by the real life. Even the prose itself, in many instances, comes from the lyrics of the musicians. I got permission from them, you see? of the musicians themselves, their poetry and so on. And then they take the story forward. But there are songs there which are only invented by me. For instance, if Boy Charles composes a song, he's a fictional character. Mm -hmm. A song like Ukes in the in, in the novel, it means that now that one I've invented. Uh, I lyrics. thought that was a popular hit. Is popular there in Wayfarer's hymns. The others are popular hits even in the real life and not only in, uh, yeah. uh, in, the, in the novel. Okay, to tell me about the, 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 the Basutu dance for sure. Um, oh, how, how, how is it connected to uh, the dance that was popular uh, you know, in the recent past? Called for Vosho. Vosho. our part of the world, yes. Yes, yes. No, no, actually, Vosho, um is an incarnation or incarnation uh, of, 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 of Fuchu. Even the name comes from there. But even the dance itself, if you go to the drinking places, Dimitri, to the Dimitris that I have attended, during my day, you see, with some of these musicians, that Vosho, the Vosho that you saw in South Africa, copies the Vosho itself, you know, without raising of the leg uh, uh, as high as you can, that's Vosho. Mm. So it is the same dance. 
Wow. Okay. And 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 here's me. I was beginning to think that uh, we we invented virtual. No, you have not. <laughs> you, you are like me. Who thought I've invented professional money? You didn't invent anything. You just yeah. stole stole from my people in the suit. Well, I, I, I'll tell to Julius that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> or maybe the, maybe the EFF um, were the first yeah. to do virtual in parliament. <laughs> well, you know, I've often teased uh, Julius about, about that virtual, you see, mm. because it was a very pathetic uh, uh, virtual indeed. <laughs> I, you know, I, I, I told him that the gods of virtual are very angry with you. And uh, will punish you for that virtual that you did in parliament. <laughs> wow. Okay, just a reminder, um, I'm in conversation, uh, lunch our conversation with uh, uh, Professor Zeixinda. Um, so you can uh, send your comments, questions in our chat box via Facebook. Uh, we're also live on YouTube. Um, Malume, <clears throat> still on the, on, on the question of uh, your research. I mean, there are parts here on page 34. Okay. I, I'm gonna read it. It sounds very, you know, familiar to me. Uh, where uh, this character says, I do not see what I'm working for. My money disappears even before it gets into my hands. I am robbed every day by my, by Malignane Eliabolosi, e, sorry, excuse the Malignane Eliabolosi. Malignane Eliabolosi, the offspring of Diablo, the horned uh. one who also goes by the name of Satan, the civil one who also, the civil one also known as record companies. John Nawe, this child of CMA has been eaten to the bone by record companies. Were, were, were these some of the comments you got while doing research? Well, not really, because as I might have told you, I, I didn't do any formal research for this novel. I just drew from the life that I know, the lyrics that I know. Maybe then you can call it research as well, because I would listen to a song before I incorporate it into my lyrics, you know, in the same way that contemporary musicians will sample a song mm. and incorporate it in the new song that you are creating. It's a method that you know very well in literature is known as intertextuality. You do it in music as well, where they call it sampling. Here, of course, uh, using those lyrics and so on. What we have quoted there, in fact, did not come from research, but it came from my listening to that character, who says was him, because she's a real life character. Mm. In my conversations, or even when she's being interviewed by others, she's always complaining how she was robbed by record companies. And we know that those days, many of our musicians died poor. They would be given just money, maybe 25 rounds after recording a song. They would not get any royalty and so on. If they did get a royalty, it would be very tiny. It's all that money went to record companies. That's why we heard Omar Shatin, Omar Shatin died poor and so on. Why? Because they were robbed by, this, by these record companies. Things became like that for many years. They were changed by who? By Kwaito. The Kwaito stars began to take over when you look at the value chain of, of the industry, to take over elements of that value chain in the same way that contemporary writers are doing now. Contemporary writers in South Africa are beginning to take over, in other words, to be active participants on that value chain. You see, with us, you wrote a manuscript, you gave it to the publisher, then from there you get some measly 
10% or 15% royalty. And they were in control of, of everything and they would get the bulk of, of the money. But you young writers, you are establishing your own publishing houses. Whether you are Zugiswa Vanner, you'll have your publishing. You are in other words, you, you, you are now becoming a participant on that value chain. Whether you are a pure Mahala, you, I know you have your own publishing outfit. If you are Angela, the beautiful Angela Mapolna, you even go further and have your own printing company where Zugusa Vanner or Zeksimda will print some of his books or her books, which we have done with Angela. So you see, writers themselves, they are participants now on the value chain of the book industry so that they get a share that they, this thing was started by the Kwaito stars. That is why you see a, a, an artist, Nick Mshongo, having his books in the boot of his cars, of his car. Well, I said cars, you see, because I, 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 I thought he's, he's a multimillionaire. <laughs> but in the boot of his car. And he will be going around under the peach tree selling his books or in some shibin and so on. He decides that I'm going to be the bookstore myself. Fred Kumalo does that as well. I'm no longer going to wait for exclusive books to sell my books for me. I'm going to sell them for myself, you see? So that's why I'm saying contemporary writers have copied methods that were invented by Kwaito stars. The exploitation of me, of, of musicians, ended with the Kwaito stars who first sold their CDs from the boot of their cars like Nick Mflongo is doing, but ended up now having their own labels and their own distribution companies, their own you know, outfits, which became mammoth. And other musicians then would record under their stable and so on and so forth. You see, they took over from the Krog brothers, those tiny twins who emigrated to Australia, who also invented skin lightning creams, who were exploiting these musicians because they were involved in that music industry as well, especially during our days of the penny whistle. Most folks, my she and name him Mabaso, were robbed by the Krog brothers who are now eating that money where? In Australia. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, um, there are, um, in the book, there are artists who um, somewhat extend the value chain beyond the music industry, and they venture into mining. And here on page 67, you say, the bit about mining confused me, but I did not question it at the time. I was just mesmerized by the fact that these men heartened and experienced in the ways of the formal music business were offering me stardom. What is the connection between music, connection, gangsterism, yeah. and mining? That connection is something that I also discovered because I did not know that. I didn't know the, the, the network beginning with the musicians themselves who then become gang leaders and, and, and generals, you know, commanders of the battles and the deaths that are happening. And this network extends to the circumcision schools in the mountains of Lesotho, where a lot of those boys then begin their training in music. But you see, everything begins with music in music, but also in battle in order to be, to, to have that loyalty to the main, to the Khaleke. Khaleke, then that's the main musician, the, the eloquent one. And then the network extends to mining operations in Belcom and everywhere where, you know, you find the people that we in South Africa call the Zama Zama miners. You'll know that in my book, I don't use that word Zama Zama. 
because I didn't find those musicians and those miners of the sort of using it um, among themselves. You know, they only call themselves Banna Bami Rafu, you know, the men who mine the gold, the men of the mines. And they actually own those operations because everyone else who goes there, you know, has to pay some fee. If you go there to mine for yourself, you pay some fee to the bosses, and those bosses are musicians from the suit, in order to be allowed to go underground to mine for yourself. And some of the bosses extend, you know, and have, you know, distribution networks. And then all that gold finds its way back to the mainstream, because where do you sell your gold if not to the industrial, uh, to the corporate world? Hmm. Yeah, well, um, <clears throat> On that note, we had a bit of a challenge with the comments, but um, you know they are trickling in now. Uh, I'm gonna read just a few uh, and then um, read again before we finish. Uh, this okay. one is from um, uh, Ismail Mohammed, the director of uh, the Center for Creative Arts, which hosts uh, Time of the Writer. He says, we shall sing for the fatherland and other plays. Is the first place clip that I ever read. I was a high school student at the time. I bought the book from a secondhand book stand. It cost almost my weekly allowance. I love the book. It sparked my interest in reading play scripts. And it also kindled my love affair with Zex and Dar's books. So probably um, uh, if it was not for, for that play. Um, as, um, you would not be having a smile today. Exactly. <laughs> So <laughs> thanks for that. But what, what amazes me is that um, uh, Ismail is, is not young himself. Yet he says he read you while you are still in high school. What, at what age, uh, how old were you when you wrote that, that play? Oh my goodness, I don't know. I will have to calculate because when I wrote it, I was at high school myself. Uh -huh. When I wrote in high school. I was at Peg High School. I was doing my trick at the time. What kind of student were you? <laughs> oh, I was a very dumb cop kind of student because is, instead of focusing on mathematics and science and the things that would make you pass and go to the university and, 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 and be a great scientist or a great lawyer or whatever, I was focusing on writing plays and so on. And then when the beaters would come, or the all-rounders to play at my high school, then I would run away with them as they tour. You see, you find that now I'm with out there, you know, in the concert halls. Mm. You see that? Yeah, and you know, I, I'm just wondering how much time do you have for other dom corps? The reason for that, um, in uh, May 2003, mm. a certain Dom Corp out of the blue wrote to you um, asking you to read his, uh, his stories. And yes, you did. I'm just looking for your comment now. Oh my goodness. Um, you gave him feedback. Uh, the stories, one of them was called The Suit Continued. Uh, that Dom, Dom Cop was me, I was a student at, at Vets at the time. Mm. And um, I was so excited that I, I told whoever cared to listen that Zixim Da read my story. And, uh, and thought- I, I, I was not too harsh because I'm often quite frank and uh, brutal, which is not a good thing, but you know, you, I cannot you, help but tell the truth. You were harsh, harsh, but um, you you did say there's oh, potential yeah. in me. I'm sorry. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. You did say there's potential in me, and I'm I'm I'm, I'm able to capture humorous moments. Uh, okay, here yeah, it is. I mean, this is how you ended it. Say, I see oh, great goodness. talent in you as a writer. 
you are able to capture humorous situations. Keep it up. Um, so I never look back after after that the, that moment. And uh, thank you for that. And I'm wondering how much of these uh, random requests you get, and how do you handle oh. them? No, 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 no. I don't want them. <laughs> yeah, because now I'll be deluged by many others. Mm. You see? Mm. But I'm glad that I was able to read yours and then I made those comments. Um, yeah. But, yeah. you know, sometimes you get too many of these things. Mm. There's a, there was a time when I was getting 200 uh, letters by letters, I mean emails. Um, you know, you find that I have 200 a week that I have to respond to and so on. Therefore, when, when am, I, am I going to paint my, my paintings or write my own stories and so on? So I don't encourage others to be other CPOs and send me their, their stories, no. Uh, but once in a while, you know, I find a story attractive, I read it. And indeed, um, I can comment on it. Yeah, can you give us an idea of a, a Zixim dark kind of a day? Um, I'm asking because I, you know, I think my first um, physical interaction with you where we shared space for significant time, we were in, in Vienna, 2006. And, mm -hmm. um, there you would say, you know, you were very clear that from such and such a time and such and such a time you have to write and each day you have to finish a certain number of words. And mm. that reminded me, and sometimes, you know, we would be spontaneous and say, let's go for dinner somewhere. But if you had not planned to do that, or let's go out, you, you would refuse to join us. And that reminded me yeah. of what um, uh, uh, the late Mulelo Zamane told me about you, that sometimes he would visit you and you would really see each other because you are both sitting in your rooms working. You, you meet at mealtimes. So how is your day normally? Hmm. Mm. Well, uh, I'm afraid now I'm going to tell you that it's, it's quite different from what Mbulelo said. By the way, Mbulelo was a very, very loving person. You know, uh, he, that's one thing I miss about him. Loving, real, real, genuinely loving. He was the kind of a guy who would, you know, I, I live in Athens, which is in the rural areas of Ohio over there. Just like human Sega. They would, out of the blue, say, hey, tomorrow I'm coming. And they come all the way from somewhere very far. They will take a, a flight and go and see you there. He is right that, of course, we would be working on, 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 on something. I would be in my room, and he would be in his room in my house there. And they would be, you know, would be writing. Then we meet at mealtimes. In the evening, then that's only the time we go and see friends and have a drink together and, and so on. Um, but now I've, I've, I've become much more flexible. I remember you asked Nick, Nick Mshongo will also tell you a similar story to, to Mbulelo's because I was with him in Wales somewhere, you know, in some, some bundus of, um, of the United Kingdoms, Kingdom. And uh, we were not happy about many things then. And I spent my time there writing. Whilst uh, Nick Mflongo would go out to explore the place and to drink and to meet other people, other writers and musicians and so on. Why? Because I had a program that I've got to finish this novel on a specific date, not just period, date. Mm -hmm. I have a date when I start. When I start on that date, I know the date when I'll finish that novel. So nothing will, will interfere with that. So that, that's one thing he was wondering about that. How that even here, 
in in the United I said in England, in Wales, in the United Kingdom. You are sitting down here in our room working. You see? So he marveled at that work ethic. But with me, then I'm driven by my own demons that say, tell that story. You have to tell that story. If I were, you know, to defy them, I don't think I would be a very happy person. Yeah, I, I remember where at time of the writer some years ago, and you were very specific. Uh, actually, you told us that you were writing your memoirs and you're very specific about when you'd, you'd finish them. And I questioned yes. that. Uh, I was wondering uh, what kind of writer would, uh, would be that discipline to stick to, to that schedule. But the book oh, is yes. here today and it was completed exactly at the time that you said you, you, you completed. And I said it would, yeah. Yeah. And also oh. in the same book, you say um, Mbulelo Mzamane was a very resourceful person. And he oh, yes. was instrumental in you going to the to Ohio. Is that correct? In my going for the second time. Yes. Yeah, because I, I, I went to Ohio twice. I went to Ohio as a student. Mm -hmm. Then when I finished my degree, I taught that bit and then went back to, uh, to the suit. Then I went to uh, Ohio as a professor as a professor. That's my mm -hmm going there the second time. He was instrumental in that. <laughs> it was he and Hosizile. They were still in America at, at that time. Mm -hmm. They were searching for, for me, for, you know, where I could go because I wanted to, 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 to be over there. Yeah, well, well, Mbulelo um, Mzamane was instrumental in, in my own career as well. My, my love for literature, my interest in Ken Temba in particular. And that is why mm -hmm. both my PhD and my upcoming book is dedicated to him. Okay, we, we almost out of time. Um, what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna re read the remaining um, uh, mm -hmm. comments. And then um, I would ask you to, to do your, your, your closing remarks, Madume. Uh, this one comes from Bonganim Konza. Uh, he repeats what you say, we are who we remember. And this resonates with uh, Dr. Nori Kutula Mazibukom Simang, who says, we are who we remember. So, so many gaps in our collective memory. Thank you for your brilliant historical novels, Prof, for helping us know who we are. And then Boganim Konza comes back again to say, to ask, would you recommend your books to be part of the education curriculum in South Africa? And then there is a Shangwili Padzi who says, does Zex, when are your books gonna be turned into audio as well? It is such an accessible format in this digital age. Ask audio books masters SA to do them. Perfect accents for your story. And then um, there is uh, uh, Lauren Brainweight Kabosha who says, what an immense, historic, deeply rooted creative artistry, being able to hear that a story wants to be expressed in painting or in song or in words, or accordingly being able to express the story masterfully in each of these mediums. And then lastly, Joanne Hitchens says, thank you for sharing so personally. I remember being a student of your Zakes decades ago at UCT and so enjoyed your candid approach to writing. You learned from others, I learned from you. That is our last comment. So can you give your final remark and perhaps um, uh, respond to whatever comment you think uh, you know, needs a response here? Well, fortunately, there, there was no question in any of those comments. So all I can do is, is to thank everybody, uh, especially for the encouragement, because as, as you know yourself, you know, encouragement, we, I mean, we, we really cannot survive without it. We always love to hear that people appreciate what we do. So I'm very grateful to everyone then who commented. Uh, well, there was a question as well there. Would I 
like my books to be part of the curriculum and so on. Oh yes, of course, everybody would like that. And indeed, in my case, uh, they are part <coughs> of the curricula at many other institutions in South Africa there and many educational systems because unfortunately, well, maybe fortunate or unfortunate, we have many different educational systems, maybe as many as we have provinces, and then we have the national one as well. So in some, in, 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 in some systems, some provinces, my work is prescribed. In fact, I am very happy the way that I am received in South Africa. By I, of course, I mean my work. You see, I've often heard writers complaining that, oh, you know, uh, we are not recognized here at home. We'll only be recognized perhaps if first we are recognized overseas, then only then will our people recognize us. Fortunately with me, I don't have that complaint. I was recognized in South Africa first before I was recognized overseas. And I, I have a much, much bigger audience in South Africa than I have overseas. I do have books published in other countries as well. But that's why I always insist that each one of my novels, even today, must be published in South Africa first before it's published in America or England and so In other words, the Americans, the British, the Europeans, or whoever else must buy the rights from South Africa rather than the, the other way around. Because it's important to me that South Africa must end some of the foreign exchange. Because me, I'm looking at it from that angle. Some of the foreign exchange um, from overseas, from, from my work, must come to South Africa. Wow, thank you for that and thank you for writing. Um, but let me teach you a bit of English. South Africa yes. here, you, you seem to forget that you are in South Africa now. What did I say? You say South Africa there. <laughs> oh, my goodness, I am in South Africa, man. <laughs> I'm used to being elsewhere. Yes, Is yes. It? Yeah, yeah. Welcome back. Uh, we're hoping for more engagements. I wish there was more time. Um, I love your work. I still can't decide which of your novels mm -hmm. I love best. At some point, Me this too. was my favorite novel. This also was my favorite novel. And I yeah. love this one as well. I thought yeah. this was brilliant. It did not get as much exposure it, it, it needed. This yeah. one, you write about my mother's people. I love it so much. So. Yeah. I hope there comes a, a day where I decide which one is my favorite sex and down novel. You don't have to. You <laughs> should just love them all. Yes, yes, I love them all. Wow. Yeah, no, th thank you so much. Um, and, and thanks everyone for, for tuning in. Uh, the video will be available on, on Facebook and YouTube. And uh, Time of the Writer continues until Sunday. And personally, I will be um, back as an author now discussing uh, my work with uh, Pemelo Mudine on Sunday at um, at at uh, uh, one o'clock. And by the way, Monday is um, Human Rights Day, so a time of the writer will still be happening on Monday. So we're on until Monday the twenty first. Thank you very much. Uh, keep supporting uh, literature. Thanks a lot. Ngos malum. <laughs>